Father, I'm praying tonight that whatever skill set that I may have will not suffice. It will not. We need a Holy Spirit anointing over what will be shared tonight. We know that Satan does not want people to understand this. He wants confusion around this message. So I'm just praying in the name of Jesus for clarity right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for hearing in advance and answering our prayer. And everyone said amen. And amen. Amen. You had a good, you had a good day? Yes. Yes. Uh, we got our hair done. <laughs> um, I've only got one option with my hair. Thank you. Only got one. We'll save, we'll save it tomorrow. I only got one option. Um, but we're glad to be here. And I'm anxious really to get into tonight's study. Um, let's review what we talked about last night. Can we do that? First, we realize that God's love first is proven by the fact of creation. Now, even that, that's a good stuff, man, because so often we try to prove God's love, obviously, through what he does for us. But the good thing that you need to recognize tonight is the fact that you are here. Just touch yourself right now. Just, yeah. If you are alive, that means you are loved. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the point we made here was, is that God, in God's foreknowledge, somebody say foreknowledge. God knew that we were going to kill him before he created us and did it anyway. You know why? He just can't help himself. God is love and he will not control and manipulate. He wants us to choose him the same way he chose us. I praise God for that. Second thing we learned is, is that sin is a result of deception and lies. Specifically, sin is based on character assassination. The only way that we can sin is at first we must distrust God. All sin is based on not trusting God. All of it. We can, we can make it real cute. And that's why I always tell people all the time that there, there are no bigger sins than other sins. Because any sin essentially is a lack of trust in God. And the way that lack of trust in God begins is Satan has to tell lies about God. And so we learned yesterday that, that sin is based upon defamation of character. Sin is based upon the assassination of the goodness of God. The only way you can sin is that if you think that somehow your way is better than God's way because you really don't trust God. The third thing that we uh, discovered yesterday is that the solution to our sin problem is a revelation of God's love. <laughs> Isn't that good? Like notice what I didn't say. I didn't say the solution to your sin problem is to be a better person. Good luck on that. That's not going to, that, 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 uh, the, the solution to your sin problem, uh-oh, I'm, I'm a pastor. I hesitate saying this, but it's the truth. The solution to your sin problem is not church attendance. The solution to your sin problem is a revelation of God's love. And here's the thing. Satan has so many options. He can lie. He can manipulate. He can give a little truth. He has so many options. He can use coercion, force, fear. God only has one strategy. One. I'm just going to love them and I'm hoping that my love will be enough for them to say that they, that they want me. God will not control. He will not use coercion. He will not use fear. He only will reveal his love. And I'm trying to tell you right now that that is enough to produce change. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. All right. So uh, the other thing that we kind of examined, I just you might want to take a snapshot picture of this, post this online, put it on your Instagram page or whatever. But this is this is critical for you to understand about how our relationship with God works just in our last review slide. Our, our relationship with God is not based on us loving God. Would you say amen? amen? This is a false representation. Matter of fact, I think I could play with this a little bit. This, 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 this right here is, that ain't it. All right. The second, the second uh, thing that we've been taught for the most part is that, uh, you know, we can work with God. That it's a partnership. That I love God. God loves me. And we work together. Come on. That's a lie too. That ain't Bible. That's not possible. As a matter of fact, let me say this now. You can't love God. You can't. Not in a way that will save you. The only way that you can love God is that, here it is, isn't this the one right here? That God has to come in you 
and love himself through you. And you get the credit. <laughs> That's the gospel. Come on, say amen, somebody. So everything in salvation is not, it's based on what he does for us. I want to disabuse your thought process right now that, oh man, this is, this is really going to rock somebody's world. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to help your chances of salvation or diminish your chances of salvation except not believing. Period. The whole plan of salvation is based on this crazy idea that God's love is enough and he's looking for people who are crazy enough to believe that it's real. People are going to be lost, not because they did bad things, but they didn't believe the good things. Are you with me tonight? All right, so let's, let's dive in, uh, into tonight's subject. So let's, let's take it a step further. We looked at creation. Now, essentially what I want to show you tonight is how God intervenes in the sin situation. How God rectifies, how God fixes your sin problem. How God, here it is, how God changes people's lives. How our lives change. Let me tell you why this is so critical for us to understand. Because the church has its way of changing lives. Human nature has its way of producing change. But God's way of producing change is totally counterintuitive to how we feel like change takes place. So I want to ask tonight, how many of you want to see any change happen in your life? Raise your hand. See any change? Okay, so tonight's message is for you. And there's really only one way that God goes about producing change. And we're going to see it right here in the text. It's right in the beginning of time. Let's read together. Genesis 3 and verse 7. Read with me, everybody. The Bible says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were what, everybody? Naked. That they were naked. Uh-huh. Keep reading. They sewed thick leaves together, uh -huh, and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the what? And the Bible says, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, just before we get into a few basic summarizing points on this text, let's just talk about how dumb this looks. All right. Can we just talk about how dumb this is for a second? Now, I, I, now I, none of us really knows how big Adam and Eve were, but, but I've heard a lot of people posit and, and suggest that we're talking about Adam being somewhere near about 10 feet tall, Eve at a pedestrian like nine feet tall, and man, let's just rejoice. I mean, we're talking about, now, I'm not trying to be crude, but we're talking about sisters. I'll, I'll talk to you first. Adam is a perfect man. He is, he is without law. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing wrong with him. His birthplace is the hands of an architect named God. Okay. You, you, are you feeling that? <laughs> he, listen, and God is so awesome that he does this from dirt. On the other hand, brothers, we have Eve. It's all right to say amen. <laughs> Whether you're married or not, we're, we're talking about the Bible. <laughs> Can, it's all right to say amen on the Bible. Eve is without flaw, brethren. Now, I want to spend more time on Eve than I did on Adam. Is that all right? <laughs> I mean, there are no bad hair days with Eve. <laughs> Pray for me. Help me, Lord. <laughs> no temperamental attitudes. Come on, brother. It's all right. Say amen. Huh? 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 I could go further. I mean, without flaw. I don't want Paulette's looking at me strange. I mean, without flaw. Now, we're just talking about her character. I mean, I mean, just there to serve her man and the Lord, of course, as well, right? And she, is, and she has been made in perfect symmetry. No, I'm not going to look at my wife while I'm preaching this part. I will not do it. This is Bible, by the way, anyway. So. Okay, so look at them in perfect beauty and symmetry without flaw. All of a sudden now, because they believe some lies, feeling like they have something to be ashamed of. And then they're so, they're so like dumb by sin that these big old creatures decide to make clothes out of fig leaves and they're hiding in the trees. 
to hide from God. Sin makes you stupid. They're hiding from each other. And now they're, listen, now this, I'm sorry. I just have an imagination. They're hiding from God. I don't know why that's not sinking in. Their strategy is, <laughs> let's, let's go in the trees. <laughs> Is it is it coming yet? Oh no, I think I, I think I heard I think I heard him walking. Like he does not know where they are. You're laughing, but that's how nonsensical it is for many of us being pretentious. Now, now there, there are a few there are a few points that, that we need must realize that are a result of sin that all of us have bought into. First thing, you want if you want to write this down or, or take a snapshot, it's just easier to take a picture of it um, and then write it down later. The first thing we realize about the result of sin is that uh, they realized they were naked, which in other words, sin produces self consciousness. If being self conscious is a result of sin. God never created us to be self-conscious. Anything that is self-driven is anti-love. When God created us, we were supposed to be other conscious. God conscious. But sin makes you self-conscious. You're worried about how you look. You're worried about how you dress. That's what I said the other night. Look, I mean, clearly you can tell I'm... I like the dress, but I don't really care that much anymore. <laughs> like, but uh, Mr. Sanders, like, like, you, like we, we're, we're in this thing, like, we want to present ourselves a certain way, and then we try to misconstrue it and say we're presenting ourselves because we want to look good for God. The devil is a lie. God's not looking at your clothes. He's not looking for you in the bushes. <laughs> we are self-conscious about each other. And anything being self-anything is a result of sin. God does not want us so self-absorbed. Many of you are so selfish because you are so worried about how you look, how you appear, how people think about you. Man, that's bondage. God wants to set some folks free tonight from being so self-conscious. Now put clothes on. I'm not saying I'm not saying put on the clothes. But I'm saying we many of us have an over propensity to be worried about how we how we appear to others. That's the result of sin. The second thing that is the result of sin is that they sowed fig leaves. So they were self-conscious, right? They hid from each other. And then the Bible says they sowed fig leaves, which is another way of saying they became self-righteous. So you may be asking, how is putting fig leaves on self-righteous? Because it's their salvation. Please don't miss this part. It's their attempt to remedy their sin situation. Now, I preach a whole other sermon on this. And, and the point I make out of this whole text is this. Now, I don't know what God's plan is. I just think God was big enough to fix this. I think God was big enough to fix this. I think he was big enough to fix this. What they should have done when they got naked is they should have asked God for help. How, how come we don't see that there's not one moment in this text where either one of them asked God to help and save them? But when sin messes with your mind about your relationship with each other, it makes you self-conscious and it makes you self-righteous. Fig leaves represent any attempt on man's part to make and present themselves to look better than they really are. Any attempt. Anything you're doing, what your diet is, what denomination you're a part of. Oh, y'all better hear me now. Any attempt to make yourself look superior to somebody else is self-righteous. It's fig leaves. The only thing that gives you any value is not what you put on or what degrees you amass. My wife and I are both very educated. It means nothing. Don't get like Americans and the folks in the West. Where we worship to the God of education, stuff, money, things, having stuff. This is a very nice city. I've been around for a little bit. I've seen some stuff. Some of us get caught up in this stuff. Fig leaf. It's all going to burn. Nothing wrong with having nice stuff. But hear me now, because I like to have nice stuff too. But many of us get our value from what we have. Listen to my brother. I, I, I don't know. I'm just assuming because I know it's, I mean, we're wondering about our purpose in life. We're wondering sometimes about what career we should take. And oftentimes that's driven sometimes by people's expectations of what we should do so we can show people we're successful. Who cares what people think? 
fig leaves. Self-righteousness is any attempt to make yourself more savable, more good, more righteous than you are. It's a self-salvation project, and it means nothing. As a matter of fact, you know what Paul says about your self-salvation project? He says some of the most offensive things. Isaiah actually says the most offensive thing. He says they are filthy rags. You know what that means. Has a preacher told you what that means before? No? Well, now nah, I got to be the bad guy. <laughs> filthy rags means sanitary napkins, soiled ones. Uh, Isaiah says your righteousness has the value, the sum total composite value of a soiled sanitary napkin. Then Paul, he doesn't even make it better. Paul says that your righteousness is as dung. D-U-N-G. Refuse. Oh, I hope you're offended because God is offended when you put fig leaves on. God is offended by you trying to act a certain way in order to, 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 to be seen as a righteous person. God is offended by our fig leaves. Because it essentially says to him that he does not have the power to bring about change. I, I feel like going in on some church people right now, but I'm going to save it to the end. I'll save, it, I'll save it to the end. The third thing, the third thing that was a result of sin is that they did what, everybody? They hid from God. And, and this is what sin essentially produced. It produces fear. They were scared of God. They should have said, help. They should have said, save us. They should have said, we messed up. They should have said, we got ourselves in a bind. They should have said, we were deceived. But you know what happened. After this, they start blaming each other. Their relationships start falling apart because self-consciousness produces self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is another way of hiding from God. Do you know that the best place to hide from God is in the church? You know that? This is, it's easy to hide from God here because you can be really religious. People can be impressed with your walk, but you never have honest conversations with God. Nobody can ever really tell you anything about your relationship with God. You, 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 you really don't repent. You, you more or less repent for the stuff that other people are doing. You are more concerned about fixing everybody else and changing everybody else and looking down at other people who sin differently than you do. So what's God's response? Now here, this is... Just blame it on me being American the way I'm about to act crazy right now. All right? I'm, just, I'm about to get beside myself. I'm going to shout tonight. I'm telling you. I'm going to shout. I might dance too. <laughs> this is good news right here. Like I'm saying after this debacle, after this failure, after this high handed rebellion, after this, like we're going to hide from God. They just, I mean, one day they're in total love with God. He built a planet named their bedroom pleasure. Gave them everything their heart could desire. He didn't give them a mansion. We're excited. I'm going to have, we're going to have a mansion. He gave them a planet. Every need was supplied. And beyond the, the, the physical stuff they had, they had face-to-face -face communion with God. They didn't pray. They didn't have a Bible. Like Adam and Eve didn't have to have devotion. They just called the Lord to say, come talk to us for a few minutes. <laughs> They didn't have to pray. They had God. I'm saying, and in the face of all this, God gave them absolutely, positively, no reason for them to distrust him. None. Yeah. Only a lie could have produced what came inside of them. And in the face of that, if I'm God, if you're God, they're dead. Yeah. Wait, look, I can, look, I'm God. I can erase the, the memory on my hard drive. I can start all over again. Anybody ever thought that before? Like, what didn't God just say, I'll start all over again? Because love requires a risk. And with God, the risk is worth the love. So, so watch this here. I, I don't know. Did I go back? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me go back. Go back for me. Yeah, go back for me. I got excited. I'm hitting these things. Go back again. Yeah, yeah. So watch God's response. Like, this is crazy. You're thinking now judgment is about to come. You know what they're thinking? They're thinking we're dead. Yeah. 
They're thinking we're dead. Why do you think they're hiding? You know I mean? <laughs> they're hiding because they're saying we are dead. The only way they can believe that is because they believe the lie of the enemy, right? But watch God's response. Go to the next one. This is so good. Ah, verse uh, nine of chapter three. Read with me, everybody. But the Bible says, but the Lord called to the man, where are you? Now, depending on how you view God, you're scared of that. Like, so they're hiding. <laughs> I think I heard him. You did? Yeah, I, th- I heard it. I heard him walking. And, and, and just imagine now, your mind is already messed up about God. You're scared of him. You're in self-righteousness. You're self-conscious. And God is like, in the most tender and loving way possible, where are you? Oh, Lord. He found us. <laughs> Like, and then they just start blaming each other, man. Like, shots are being fired. Like, really, they're saying, God, it was your fault. And But see, they're doing this because, here it goes again, every, every foundational way we respond to God is based on how we view God. And if you view God as, uh, as, as vindictive, if you view God as wanting to always punish you, if you view God as being temperamental, if you view God as being angry at you, if you view God as being mad at you instead of being madly in love with you, then like Adam and Eve, you assume that him looking for you is him trying to get you. But him looking for them was not him trying to get them. Him looking for them was him trying to rescue them. Yeah. This was, look, when he's saying, where are you? This was not like when you were kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how you did something wrong and you, you like you try to hide from your parents? Like, I don't know if y'all did that before. And then like, like my parents, my mom, she was not coming to rescue. <laughs> this, 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 this was coming. The belt was coming, right? Oh, no, 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 no. He wasn't coming to punish them. He was coming to try to fix the situation. But because they saw God as being against them, they could not receive the salvation. But let's just praise God right now. How many thank God right now that God comes looking for people who've messed up? Oh, man. I told you I'm going to get happy and y'all just kick me out later, right? Oh, listen here. God, God goes to the nightclub. God goes to the strip clubs. God goes to the brothels. God goes to the crack houses. Y'all getting quiet in here. I need somebody. God goes to the gay pride parade. God goes looking for sinners. Whoever taught you that God stands away when people are messed up. When I was raised, they told me if you went to the movie theater, the angels would not go. Hey, look. Some of y'all know because some of y'all have been in the nightclub when somebody broke out shooting or somebody got stabbed and it should have been you. And you know if it had not been for the Lord on your side. Oh, come on in here. Y'all might as well praise him. Listen, let's praise the Lord just for a few minutes. How many can say right now that the Lord came in my dirt? The Lord came in my mess. The Lord found me when, when nobody else was looking for me. Man, get this thought out of your mind that your God stands away from wicked people. God loves wicked people and he comes looking for them. They couldn't see it though. <laughs> I mean, he went looking. This is good stuff here. Hallelujah. Somebody say Hallelujah. Somebody praise him right now that he comes looking for sinners. No matter where you are right now, God is not so repulsed by your sin that he stays away from you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Check this out right here. Watch this. Watch this. So watch what the Lord does. This, you guys see this in verse 21. Now, mind you, they put on these fig leaves, right? They put on these fig leaves and uh, they look real stupid. And God's having a conversation with them. But notice what God does. He changes outfits. Verse 21. What does it say? It says the Lord God. Y'all give me a towel. Somebody, where have, I have a towel over here somewhere. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's getting hectic in here. Isn't that what you say? Hectic? Hectic. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me put this on so I can be proper. <laughs> hectic. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look, watch this now. So they got the wrong clothes on. The wrong clothes represents whose righteousness? Theirs right, their righteousness, right? It's self-righteousness. So God is so awesome, man. God is so cool. He's like, man, the, the, the gear, the threads that y'all got on, they, 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 I'm not feeling them. Yeah. This is like, this is, a, this is a major, this is a major fashion faux pas. <laughs> I've got to fix your clothing. Your clothing will not do. As a matter of fact, I see through the fig leaves that I made. 
The only people you're hiding from is yourselves. So he says, what we need to do. Now watch this. They never even asked for it. Now you got to get this point. They never asked for this. If you read the text carefully, you will see that not one time in the text did they ask God for grace, for mercy, for forgiveness. Show me. Oh, this is where the church gets angry with my preaching. There is not one moment in the text where they repent. Show me. Show me where they say, we're sorry. Well, well, pastor, look in the Hebrew. No, it's not there. (laughs) Show me. Look, look, look. I know I skipped a few verses, but all they do is blame each other. All they do is blame. Adam blames God. Eve Eve blames uh, uh, the serpent. Like, it's just just blaming everybody. And the crazy thing is amazing. This is awesome. So God says, like, I'm not feeling what you're wearing because it really can't cover you. So he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something I want to show you some stuff that I'm about to do thousands of years from from now that's actually going to save what you're doing right now. So the Bible says he took, the Lord God made what? Garments of what? So in other words, in order for him to take the skin of an animal, an animal had to be killed. (sighs) The first sacrifice that ever happened in the Bible was a sacrifice that God made so he can put the right clothes on him. Come on. You're not properly dressed. Take those fig leaves off and let me cover you with some blood. Oh, let me cover you with some lamb skins. Y'all not feeling me in here right now. Oh, he covers them. God's response to your sin, whether you ask for it or not, is a move to save you. The church teaches... They have taught that in order for God to rescue you, you must ask for it. Your rescue started when you started breathing this morning. The mere fact that God kept you alive is an act of his rescuing power in your life. Somebody thank him right now that he covered you. He covered you when you didn't have sense enough to ask for his covering. He covered uh, mm, my brother, my brother or my sister while you were having that affair. My brother or my sister while you were smoking that weed. How do, you, how do you think that you were able to do that and not die? God had to keep your lungs going to have the affair. You think the devil gave you life while you were smoking weed? Who kept your lungs functioning while you were sinning? Who kept you alive before the sin? Who kept you alive during the sin? All of that is God's attempt saying, uh, when they're done, when they come off the high, I'm going to be with them. When they go in the high, I'll be with them. When they go in the wrong bedroom, I'm going to be with them. For the word of God says, I will never leave you. Come on in here, somebody. Nor forsake you. (sighs) Don't mess with me tonight. I came with my gun loaded. The man of God told me I can preach as long as I want. It's going down tonight. <laughs> I know y'all got to work tomorrow. Just, lo- just walk out on me. It's fine. I know three people will stay. I know that for sure. Amen. It'll be Paulette, my wife, my kids, and the rest of them. Amen. <laughs> so, so what's to read? What, what did God do, everybody? God went into what? Come on, say it again. God does what when we mess up? He goes into rescue mode. He goes into rescue mode. Transformers, one of my favorite, like, you know, like the last two were like, but anyway. But like Transformers, but see, I was watching Transformers back in the eighties. Come on, here, somebody. I love that. He's like, so I mean, I already like cars, right? And then you put cars on robots, like what? <laughs> and then like Optimus Prime, he's just like saving lives, and like this is crazy. But like, yo, yo, so when they go when they go into the robot mode, that's called the warrior mode. Oh, y'all not hearing me now. Jesus does the same thing. When Jesus sees you in your situation, he goes into salvation mode. But guess what? Transformers transform. He doesn't ever transform. He's the same. Yesterday, today. (laughs) Ah! He's always in salvation mode because your hard head needs salvation mode all the time. So, let me show you how God saves. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew 9. I'm almost done, actually. I'm actually upset. I want to preach longer, but I'm running out of slides. But anyway, so Mark, Matthew 9, verse 9. Watch this. Well, this is a, a great New Testament example. The Bible says, and Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man named who, everybody? 
sitting at the tax collector's booth. Pause right there. See, like, you have to understand, like, a, 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 a tax collector in biblical days was like cats like mafia, like mafia gangster, like the worst. You were a traitor. You were robbing your own people. You were rich, but you were rich. He said Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, honestly, worse than Trump, worse than Trump. I mean, like, like these guys were known to be criminals. And the worst thing about it is they were nationals who were ripping off their own people. They were seen as filth. The worst of the worst. I mean, they were seen worse than lepers. I mean, think of the worst possible person, murderer, what, like anything gay, all, put, put, put them all together. That, that's how they viewed the tax collector. And the word of God says, now, that just, ah, it says, and Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. The average religious person would have gone the other way. What does the word say? And, now, 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 now. <laughs> Do y'all see this? What? He doesn't say come to church. For the meetings. No, like this is a whole nother level. He doesn't say, let's have Bible studies. He doesn't even say, you need to change your wicked life. He says, be on my ministry team. I don't know how to break it down. Like it's just, He tells him, be one of my disciples. He's trying to build a church of leaders. He goes looking for his leader in the worst neighborhood in Jerusalem. Pastor, come on now. Like, like fix that. I, what, how am I going to fix what the Bible says? Oh, oh, you feel like I'm, I'm taking it out of context. Okay, let's, let's open the floor. Let's have Sabbath school right now. Tell me. Tell, <laughs> no, seriously. Help me out here. He, doesn't, he does not say... He's saying, follow me. You know what this is, right? Because we all know Matthew. Matthew ends up writing the first book of, of the Gospels of the New Testament. Matthew becomes a mighty preacher of God, one of the 12 apostles. Jesus tells him on the job training, straight from the hood. People need to belong before they believe. Some of you guys are trying to get people to believe first before they belong, but believing is not more important than belonging. If you belong first, eventually you'll believe. Matter of fact, if you look at the life of Christ, and I saw this, I posted this on my Facebook page today. Uh, this brother was talking about this on there. He said, notice, he said, Jesus, he said, we need to stop asking people to come to church. He said, that should not be your first move. He said, your first move should be come and hang out with me. He said, come follow me. Come to my house. Come, come roll with me. Come eat with me. Come fellowship with me. Come meet my family. You're trying too hard to get people saved instead of trying to get people to see that the church is not a location, but you're the church. And wherever you are, the church shows up. Yo, he tells a straight mafia criminal, racketeering. Like they, they got Zuma on, all kind of stuff. This, this is Zuma. Some of you would be mad if Zuma joins your church. Shame on all of you. Are you ready to accept Zuma if the Holy Ghost gets a hold of him and Jesus calls his name? As long as we take Trump. Well, <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> Come on, somebody. No, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, how many, everybody? So it's not just one dude. He goes to his house where it's loaded. Come on, let's just be real. Some of y'all, y'all too spiritual. Man, people are lighting it up there. Their drinks are flowing. Yeah. These, this is, these are not church people. They don't have Martinelli's. I don't know what, uh, I don't know what y'all have. Like the vegetarian, like, like alcohol, like apple cider. That's not, that's not flowing there. I, somebody got cocaine. Oh, not then, Pastor. I, uh, let's make it real. He went to a party full of wicked people. The Bible says, so, okay, since you don't believe, it says tax collectors and what? It's a tax collectors and sinners party. They turning up. 
There's dancing. Come on, somebody. And Jesus shows up. Now, oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Ill? God bless you, man. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> When I just said this now, it could cost you, all, all, all the leadership in the scene, y'all brought me here. The church is going to look crazy at you. Jesus went to a party. That's a whole other sermon. I'm just going to leave it alone. He went, <laughs> it's quiet in here. He went to a party thrown by tax collectors and sinners. They weren't eating haystacks. They weren't watching Veggie Tales with the kids on the side. Some of these guys had their mistresses there. <sighs> Y'all better see this thing like it is. And the word says, and, and, and he ate with them. He didn't just check in and say, bro, let me pray with you real quick outside the house. Jesus went in there, got comfortable, said, make me a plate. And while these guys are, are lighting it up and, and talking crazy and cussing and swearing, Jesus is there. Oh, I don't know what God y'all serve. Seriously. Then the Bible says in verse 11, it says, and when the Pharisees saw this, oh boy, here they go. <laughs> they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with, because see, eating in biblical days, it might be even similar to this culture as well, it is a sign of what, everybody? Acceptance. Accept them. By the way, that should be the first premise of this church. We accept anybody. No dress code. No, no, what, what? No, no, what, what? You straight up acceptance. We accept you no matter if you play by the rules. And we don't give you three weeks to do it. If it however long it takes. Why? Because Jesus has accepted you in spite of your mess. Anybody here can rejoice and say, I'm still being accepted and I'm not where I should be. Right, Paul? I'm not yet apprehended, but one thing I know, forgetting those things which are behind. I'm pressing right now. <laughs> why, 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 why does your, your teacher... Notice now, they did not go to Jesus. They didn't go to Jesus. They didn't confront him. That sounds so like church people. El elder, 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 let me, I noticed, I noticed this sister, she, 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 she was, she was, uh, she was at a questionable place yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not going to tell you how I know she yeah, was there, yeah, yeah. but I think you should go and talk to her. Man, I've got one, one, one of the, one of the, one of the brothers in your praise team. He not only sings for God, but the word is, is that he also sings at the nightclub. Oh, yeah. Now, it's none of my business, but I think you should go do something about it. Man, anytime people approach stuff like that, you know that they're full of the devil. Anytime they don't have the courage to go to that person in love and tell their concern to them and they come to you being messy, you know that they are Pharisee. Rebuke them in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you right now, when people come bringing mess to you, you rebuke that satanic spirit in the name of Jesus. One of the worst ways you can kill a church is by having a spirit of gossip and judgment and a condescending spirit. How dare you? The same blood that Jesus shed for your behind. And you got the nerve to be running around talking about people because they, they, they don't sin the way that you do. The word of God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What did C.C. Winans say? She says, you weren't there when he found me. You didn't feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. You don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. How many can shout right now and say, you weren't there when he found me. And I'm glad you weren't. Where, where, uh, where, where, where does your teacher, uh, why does he eat with that? Now watch this. I love Jesus. He's so awesome. Watch what he does. On hearing this, Jesus said. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Y'all talking to me? <laughs> oh, you, you got beef. Come to me. He says, it is not the healthy. This, is, this, is the, this would be the mentality of this church. And I'm not talking about corporately. I'm talking about you. Stop being hard on people because they don't sin like you do. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the... That's why I keep telling you, 
No good people are going to heaven. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. Salvation is for bad people. Does that make sense to you? Like you would not need, you know, salvation means to rescue. You would not need rescuing if you were not in trouble. Salvation is for troubled people. All of you. Me included. Amen. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. So watch this. I love this part right here. He says, but, but go and learn what this means. I desire and not what? Now, let's pause right here. The leaning of Christians should be mercy. And what he means by sacrifice there is judgment. Like we ought to err on the side of mercy. We ought to be erring on giving people as many chances as possible. Now, I'm going to say something now, and I don't know what your viewpoint is on it, and we can debate it as long as we're here. My personal practice at my church, and I'll just use this example. If someone has fallen into sin, depending on the nature of the sin and depending on their response to the sin, we are not going to disfellowship them. Now, now, now hold on. Explain this to me. A girl gets pregnant out of wedlock. Does she want to get pregnant? First of all, the sin is not being pregnant because God only can give life. The sin is sex outside of marriage. What some of you are doing is just that you ain't pregnant. So she's pregnant, right? And she's normally distraught that she's pregnant. She's normally like, what am I going to do? And my experience has been, I've rarely run into a sister like that. That is defiant. Disfellowship is for defiance and apostasy. It is for rebellion. When Jesus is asking people to be his disciples who are thieves... Why are you putting people out the church? Because they made a mistake. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Well, we have to preserve the name of the church. The best way to keep the reputation of the church awesome in the community is not by putting people out, but by showing mercy to people when they've messed up. Right, you, honestly, you think in this secular society in Johannesburg that people are going to say, that's a good church. They put out everybody. <laughs> they kicking everybody out. I mean, just, I mean, I want to go to that church. <laughs> like, I want to be kicked out too. Like, I, no. Notice what the word says. Notice what the word says. Let me, let me, let me skip here. Let me, let me use this illustration. I'm going to close. I found this in this little awesome book. I can't, I can't remember it, but this is so cool. Check this out. It just really emphasizes the point. It says, uh, this is a memo to Jesus from the Jerusalem Management Count Consulting Firm. They, they, they've assessed Jesus' hires for this new ministry venture, and they have recommendations for him. And so they say, uh, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken a series of tests and we have not only run the results through our computer, but we have also conducted an in-depth interview with each of them by our staff psychologists and vocational aptitude consultant. The profiles is going somewhere <laughs> of all the tests are included and you will want to study each of them carefully. It is the staff's opinion that, the, that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. Wow. Buckle your seatbelts. They do not have the team concept. And we would highly recommend that you continue your search for persons with more experience, higher qualifications, and greater managerial abilities. All right, let's start with the first one. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and is given to fits of temper. Andrew simply has no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, place personal interests above company loyalty and have failed anger management assessments and use foul language incessantly. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale among the ranks. 
It is also our duty to inform you that the Better Business Bureau of Greater Jerusalem has received reports on Matthew regarding questionable business practices such as money laundering, insider trading, and racketeering. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical terrorist leanings and both demonstrate attitude problems which would present difficulty in their dealings with the public. However, one of your candidates shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is very religiously inclined, highly motivated, ambitious, attends Sabbath school. Excuse me, I'm sorry, that went in there responsible and is not afraid to take initiative we recommend Judas Iscariot as the most qualified of all your prospective candidates sincerely the Jerusalem management consulting firm oh don't we get it wrong every time oh don't we get it wrong every time if we were to look on the outward appearance we'd say Judas is the one with me uh, we would question every decision Jesus made. Look at Abraham. Abraham had a side chick. Her name was Hagar. Trying to help God out. Uh, 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 look at Moses. Moses was a murderer before he led the children of Israel out of the wilderness. Uh, 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 have you ever heard of a man named David? <laughs> uh, uh, not only was he, he, he an adulterer, but, but on, on numerous occasions, he defied and distrusted God. Uh, all throughout scripture, we see God choosing the bad guys. We see God using the bad guys. We see God selecting and empowering the ones that none of us would choose. But that's his way of saving. Jesus does not say, by saying get better and then join me Jesus says I'll put you on my team now the way you are and in the process of that I'll change your life watch this here watch this here a few more texts and then I'm done what if the church was for good people then all of you leave right now right now here's my text I got proof this is my text right here. The Bible says in Romans 2 and verse 3, it says, So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? He says, Or do you show contempt? Now watch this. Now, please don't miss this phrase here. He says, Or do you show contempt for the riches? Not yet. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? No, notice what he's saying. Paul is saying, many of us, we don't like grace. We show contempt for his kindness. We show contempt for his patience. We show, we don't like too much grace. It's not good for the church. He says, why do you do that? Not realizing, now here's, here, this is it. <laughs> I told you I'm going to be happy on this, right? Like, and I can't dance to save my life, but I'll try tonight, right? Watch this. It says, not realizing, here, here's the word, everybody, that God's kindness lead, is intended to lead you to repentance. Mm. Grace precedes, empowers, inspires change of behavior. You will not even repent unless you are moved by the kindness of God. You, you don't think I'll repent so God is kind to you. No, God is kind to you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and that motivates you to repent. Look at Ellen White. It's not even official until you put Ellen White's statement out there, right? <laughs> Look what she says. She says, it was taught by the Jews that before God's love is extended to the sinner, he must repent first. You were taught that too. Can't get no grace. Until you get it right. Majority of people that don't come to church come, don't come for this reason. Because they will say, I got to get myself together before I come. Live from hell. P.O. Box. Hell. Address. Hell. Zip code. Hell. Look. 
He says, that was, that's what was taught. He, well, well, thank you, Ellen White. Thank you. She says, we do not repent in order that God may love us, but he reveals his love in order that we repent. You know what repentance is, right? Repentance is change of behavior, change of mind, change of behavior. If you breaking your sin curse happens first by God heaping and lavishing love all over you. That's the thing that motivates you to say, I don't want to be like this anymore. I got to, I got to, I got to give this one. I got to, please. Can I, can I, can I read this one? I got, cause Ellen White has been used to be the, I got to, I got to make her a hero again. Watch this. She says, some had been bringing in false tests and had made their own ideas and notions a criterion. Magnifying matters of little importance into tests of Christian fellowship. Yeah, you know she said this, did you? And binding heavy burdens upon others. Thus, a spirit of criticism and fault finding and dissension had come in, which had been a great injury to the church. She says, now here's the crazy thing. She says, and the impression was given to unbelievers that Sabbath keeping Adventists were a set of fanatics and extremists. Don't do this. Don't do that. Can't go here. Can't go there. So what's an Adventist? We can't. We don't. And then people see us as fanatics. Ellen White's words, not mine. And she ends, she says, and that their peculiar faith rendered them unkind, uncourteous, and really unchristian in character. Christians are supposed to accept people where they are, not be tripping about what they got on. Thus, the course of a few extremists prevented the influence of the truth from reaching the people. Look, very clearly, this is all I'm saying tonight. That there is no change that happens unless grace starts it. Jesus does not wait for us to fix ourselves. He comes after us. Go ahead, remember. He comes after us. If you ever have sense enough to want to change, it's because God has been so good to you that you actually start thinking about it. Do you think that the idea came in your mind to make a change on your own? No, God put that inside of you. Your heads bowed, your eyes are closed. Got to make a straight up appeal tonight. Here it is. God's love has touched you. You feel it right now. You sense it. You believe it right now. That you are living in grace right now. <laughs> right now, your whole life's testimony is the Lord has been kind to me. The Lord has been great. He has blessed me better than I deserve. And because of that, I want to say thank you to him. Now, this is how you say thank you. You say thank you by living a life of gratitude. A life of gratitude is a life of keeping his commandments. Of loving him and loving others. We don't keep his commandments because we want to be saved. We keep his commandments because he saved us. Listen, somebody tonight wants to walk with Jesus like they have never walked with him before. And they want to do this motivated, inspired, impassioned by a love relationship with him and not by duty, not by guilt, not by fear. But you just are overwhelmed right now. I'm, uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody tonight who has the courage to stand up on their feet in front of all these people and come stand here right now. If you, if you feel a sensing that God has just blessed me better than I deserve and I just want my life to be pleasing to him, I want to serve him not because I'm scared I'm going to hell. I want to serve him because his love has just been so amazing in my life and I'm unworthy of it and I just want to say thank you with my life. If the Lord is 
is talking to you, if that's your desire, simply to stand, come forward and say, I'm publicly making a declaration. No matter how long I've been in the church, no matter how new I've been in the church, no matter if I'm officially in or not, but I just want to stand and say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for blessing me, for keeping me, for providing for me. When I was never worthy of any of your blessings, I want to say thank you with my life. If that's your decision tonight, stand to your feet, come to the front with me, the preacher who's standing here right now as well, simply saying, I want my life to be a life of gratitude. That's the mindset. The mindset is, I, I don't have to, you don't have to do anything. You want to do it. You want to trust him. You want to serve him. Why? Because he put his kindness on you. <laughs> Father, never right now. Where would we be? If it were not for your grace. Carrying me. Israel Houghton says. Through every season. Where would I be. If not for your grace. You came to my rescue. And now I want to thank you. For your grace. If that's your testimony tonight. Just lift your hands. You're just saying thank you tonight. Just saying thank you. That's all it is. Your life is just a thank you. It's that simple. It's that simple. Get rules out of your head. And say thank you. Say thank you with your speech. Say thank you with your relationships. Say thank you, thank you with, with, with the decision you make. Some of you need to say thank you in baptism for this coming Sabbath. We'll get there. But, but at, we, tonight, I just want you to get your motive right. Your motive is not fear. Your motive is not any of those things, manipulation. Your motive is simply, man, man God has been good, man. It's thank you, Lord. I should have lost my mind. I should have took my life. I should not be here today. Thank you, Lord. That's your mindset. Everything you do comes from a place of gratitude. Father, you see your people tonight. They're full of gratitude. How can we, how can we go out here and mistreat people when you've been good to us? How? How can that happen? How can we be full of unforgiveness when you have forgiven us over and over again? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may return to your seats.
loving kindness towards me. Your tender mercies I see day after day after day after day forever faithful towards me. Always provide. Always provide. Always provide.